Welcome to the Change Within Podcast. My name is Gerard Uselli. We are on episode 31, and it just continues and continues within a span of two months, exploring so many people's perspectives on change. And all throughout the country, I've been talking to so many people, but this stands out, especially on a social media scale. More to come with my next guest, Megan Long. Megan, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. So just to get right into it, as I always like to ask this first question to all of my guests on the Change Within podcast, is what your childhood was like okay. growing up. Yeah, so my childhood was rough. Um, I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. I grew up in a very, uh, not a very good area. So it was a rough neighborhood. Uh, I grew up in an abusive home. Um, so just all around, it was tough times. <laughs> Absolutely. And in those tough times, I feel like when you're at your roughest point of vulnerability, you're able to kind of find opportunity, even when you're not seeking it out. Was there ever that one time maybe in your childhood where it was kind of like, wow, something kind of made like a revelation in my life. And maybe there's like a brighter sense of direction I could go to. Um, I think for me, and I don't know if it was growing up in that environment or if it's just part of my nature, but it was ever present or prevalent in my mind to me that this was not an ideal situation and that it was constantly part of me to ensure that my personal future and the future of my future children and all of that was just going to be something totally different. Something that my mom always said to my siblings and I, uh, when we were growing up, and maybe this is part of that thought process for me was she would say to use bad people or negative people as a good example of what not to be. And I think that maybe that was just so ingrained in me that there was never particularly a moment, but just a projection of where I wanted to be and not end up, I think a lot of times people end up in the same cycle, the same situation that they came from. And so for me, my whole life, it was like, this is not where I end up. I think with a difference on your end, especially considering how motivators are on the scale of social media. And I watched a video of yours, which was very interesting because you're really driven by like drive and determination. And that difference mm -hmm. really showcases that you have to work for yourself as hard as you can be to help others kind of perceive themselves to be around you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I definitely don't come from anything ever having been given or provided or just there without question. Uh, I definitely come from a place where if you want something, you have to work for it. That's the only way you get anything. And in that light, I've never been afraid to work for anything. You know, I'm, I ha I set goals and I can get after them because, you know, I just, that's what you do. It's just, that's how you, you get from A to B, you know, it's how you get what you want and where you want to be. And I think that more and more that uh, perspective is missed on people. Um, I think often as parents, we have this idea of like, I want to give my kids better than what I had. And then we kind of end up hindering them because we we remove their ability to develop that work ethic. And that understanding that whatever I have is on me, whatever I want is on me. And so that's something that I've struggled with is trying, <laughs> I want my kids to have a better life than I had, but I also want them to know <laughs> the struggle that I had. And so it's this constant balance of how do I teach you that, you know, provide stability and security and safety, but also teach you that you have to provide that for yourself someday and be capable of doing so. I think it goes to show that humility can be presented in every step of the ladder. Sure. Yeah. And I think to that point, also in humble beginnings, especially using social media, do you remember the first time you ever made like a social media account? And did you think it would be as big as, as, it, as it is today? Okay. So I'm going to age myself here. 
I think that the very first social media I had was Live Journal. Do you remember that? Oh man. <laughs> well, I'm dating myself too because I remember that perfectly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I figure like you're wearing a brand new shirt, so we're probably from the same. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. So pretty. Yes. <laughs> Favorite band. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure Live Journal was the first social media that I had. And I actually got into my old Live Journal a few years ago. And it was just like, it was crazy going back and reading. And I love it because at that point in time, we didn't, right now, people use social media and they like curate their presence on social media. They make who they want to be presented as. And for me, that's something that's very important is everything you see on my social media, it's very genuine. It's very me. It, you're going to get the same type of interaction in person as you are on my social media with me. Um, I can be, I can be like snarky and short on there. I can be very genuine. I can be fun, you know, just whatever. And I don't want to, um, create a persona. I just don't feel like there's any, it's disingenuous. And also I don't know how people keep up with it. Like I couldn't for a long term keep up creating this ideal. And I think back in the live journal days, we didn't have that filter over ourselves. And so we were all just like <laughs> spilling our guts on our live journal, you know? And right. so we really, like when I went back and I read mine and I read comments and I read my friends, I was like, man, we really were vulnerable. And I really enjoyed that. But no, I don't think that that could be as big, you know, now I think the way that social media has evolved, it's just, I don't think anybody would be that real anymore. That's true. And especially in today's age, because when you think about what you've done in your live journal, there's more yeah. of an authenticity as far as well, people try to present themselves as being authentic, like mm -hmm. on a main scale of branding, especially in today's yeah. age. But then when you actually write your thoughts and feelings, it's harder to have that expressed in today's age compared to what it was like back then. Yeah. I, I will post things that feel very vulnerable to me sometimes. Like just today, um, I just posted something a little while ago talking about how I've just been in a stressful place lately and I got ready and I went to the gym and then I just sat in the parking lot until I came home. And then I ended up coming home and making Rice Krispie treats and eating them while they were still gooey, like <laughs> totally opposite of what I had planned <laughs> for my life. But um, it's, it can feel so vulnerable sometimes saying like, I had this goal and I failed or I didn't live up to whatever the expectation was. And for me personally, it's not so much the expectation of other people, but myself, like I hold myself to such a standard and it's like work really hard and get after what you want. And, you know, when I have goals, I have to keep after them. So even if it's a day or a week or whatever, where I feel like I'm slipping, I push myself harder than, you know, other people would. So for me, like I'm my biggest critic and posting things like that for me feels very vulnerable. But I also understand the importance of it because if I feel that way, other people feel that way too. And, right. you know, social media is like the highlight reel. So everybody puts all the, the great and wonderful experiences, but that's not real life. We're not all having great and wonderful experiences. And that's something that I sometimes struggle with is like, how personal do I get? Because like, I don't share my children on there at all. Most people don't even realize that I'm a mother of three. Um, on a occasion what's that god bless <laughs> thank you um on occasion i'll stick them in my stories or something but my my children are very like the most important and personal thing to me so the internet doesn't deserve them you know and um and they can choose when they're older that's something i had thought of when my social media was private and it was just friends and family i, I had them all over it but when I went public, I took them down because when we were growing up, it wasn't something like, oh my gosh, my mom's going to share this on her Instagram or whatever. And so we have no concept of what it feels like to grow up in that, like 
you're going to be exposed to the world outside of your own choice. Cause every, our experience with social media is strictly how we choose to use it to present ourselves. So I try and be conscious of that about my kids is they're not choosing to share themselves or their experiences with 17,000 people. I am. So that's why I don't share them. And I've gotten some ugly backlash about it before. Just people saying that I'm um, like, I'm very self-centered and narcissistic and da da da. And I need to be more family oriented, but in my mind, like I'm being the most family oriented by protecting my children from that. So, well, yeah, it's, I, it's kind of, it's uh, definitely kind of interesting that you said it because I'm going to skip around a little bit in the questions as you brought up that point, because a way that you're doing so is by collaborating with so many brands and companies that not only suit your hobbies, but then also how your lifestyle has came to fruition nowadays. So like when you're doing these promo and sponsorship deals for different companies, how do you determine who you want to work with? So the reason I went public to begin with, um, I went public with my account in October of 2020. And the reason I went public was because I like to support law enforcement and veteran owned companies. Just they, I have a lot of law enforcement and military in my family. I respect them. And if we can support their businesses, like not to get too political, but they don't get enough support publicly. They don't get everything they deserve, right? In my opinion. So I would love to support their businesses. So I went public to share a brand um, of gym wear that I had and it was a uh, gym Fidel. And so I was like, oh, I wanna be able to tag them. So I made my account public and I tagged gym Fidel and then they shared and then some other pages picked it up and it just kind of like went out of control. But that's why I went public in the first place was to share brands. And the way that I choose which brands I affiliate with are um, everything that I affiliate with is American made. Um, they are generally either law enforcement or veteran owned or they're patriotic um, inspired companies. They, they support two way, they support patriotic Americans. And those are things that are important to me and things that right now I feel like if I have a platform, I, those are the things I want to give a voice to. And so I would, I've turned down a lot of um, collaborations for companies that they're just, I mean, random products that I may or may not even use. Like everything that you see on my page is something that I use in my personal life and I genuinely support the company that uh, created the product. Definitely. And also in the sense of how, uh, how things can be on a scale of what you support, something that I want to ask that's an important question because we as a country should take all sides into account. How does the Second Amendment impact your life and what do you think needs to change? Um, so personally, I think that it impacts my life as a woman. I feel empowered to be my own first responder. I am my own security. I am my own protector. Um, my husband is a merchant mariner. He's away a lot. I'm alone with my kids and I don't want to be helpless. The reality is physically, I'm helpless against most men. That's just, I mean, I work out a lot and I lift weights a lot. And the reason that I got into that was because I wanted to be strong. I wanted to have a physically fighting chance. And so for me, I work out to build strength. The aesthetics is ancillary. And obviously, you know, we all enjoy these, the aesthetics of working out. But for me, like my big goal is strength training. I want to be strong. And along with that, having the ability to carry a firearm to protect myself and my children without having to actually physically encounter a person like hand to hand, face to face kind of thing is, I mean, every mother, every person should have that right, but every mother should absolutely have that ability to protect herself, her children, her home. Um, as far as what needs to change, I believe in constitutional carry. Yeah, I think that 
that we should have the right to carry in any state. We're all citizens of the country. In all states, we should have the right to carry. Um, I hate when I travel with my kids to think, okay, can I have my gun here? Is there reciprocity with my license in this state? You know, Because then when we go places, especially if we fly or whatever, I feel so like, Ugh. and not to be um, uh, cocky or whatever, but I get attention when I go places. And a lot of times men are just oblivious to the fact that the way that they interact with women, like if they see a, a woman that they are attracted to, they're, they can come off very aggressive and um, intimidating and creepy, very creepy. And I don't think a lot of times they're really even aware of the way that they present themselves. But as women, we have to constantly be aware of that. And so I'm a big uh, proponent for constitutional carry. I think that we, I mean, we just had saw the shootings in Atlanta and this gentleman purchased his firearm legally and there was nothing in his background that would have prevented it. So I don't think that strict gun laws are going to really make a difference. It's a person could be healthy and fine and have a great history and then have a negative experience and everything had changed down the road, you know? And I think it's so, it's not the government's place to decide who may or may not uh, make bad choices. But I think it's all of our right to make the choice to protect ourselves should we encounter one of those people. I'm going to mention a story real quick. So the first time that I was in Georgia and I went to LJ, Georgia, right? So uh -huh. I had friends who had family there and I visited one of the family's house. Now, of course, I'm from New York. It's the Mecca of like strict gun laws. <laughs> we yeah. could both, we could both presume sometimes how ridiculous that could be. Uh -huh. So, but the hindsight of it, especially on the opposite side of like the issues compared from New York to Georgia is when I went down there, I go over the person's house and there's like 10 to 12 year old kids at the time. They're carrying like swords, no big deal. They have like a gun out and stuff like that. And I'm just like, I'm like 25, 26. I'm just like, whoa. Like, what is this? <laughs> I, I mean, um, I'm older now, obviously, but still, I'm just like, whoa, that's crazy. Well, and it's a, it's a culture thing, right? Like we accept what exactly. we're exposed to. Yeah. And so I grew up in Georgia and I come from a very Southern family and my, my husband's dad uh, was a cop. And so of course, you know, he was around guns, but I come from this family where everybody's out hog hunting and there's guns like every crevice you look in. Um, and, and so the first time that my husband came and visited my family, he was genuinely shocked because there's, there's a big variety within, you know, uh, gun owners and two way supporters and all of that. You have people who are completely by the book. They keep everything locked up tight. They keep everything, you know, to a T safety, all of that. And then you have some of us who were just raised in the sticks and <laughs> there's kind of guns laying around everywhere. But I will say that, and, and this is how I kind of raised my kids in a middle ground there because if, if I need access to a gun in the middle of the night because I'm home alone and there's an intruder, I'm not gonna be able to fumble through um, security and locks and combinations and all of that because I just know that that's going to be an impediment for me. Um, my kids have always, always been given the opportunity anytime we've had a new gun, we sit down, we explain it to them, we show it to them, show mm -hmm. them it's unloaded, here, hold it, touch it, get familiar with it because that removes the taboo and the curiosity and the secrecy around it and then we started, they all got their first BB gun when they were three and we started shooting that. They learned trigger discipline and muzzle control and things like that with a BB gun. So if there's an accident, it's not really that big of a deal. Um, 
And I'm sure I know people are gonna say, you can get hurt with BB guns. Like, yeah, obviously. Um, but then they moved on and they've all shot, you know, everything from 380 handguns to ARs to 12 gauge, you know, they've shot everything. And the first shotgun that they shot was a 410 or they were given was a 410 because I wanted them to like feel the power. I'm like, let's go right into it. Like high caliber. Here's a 12. You can't quite hold a 12 gauge, but you can hold a 410. You can hold a 45. <laughs> I wanted them to learn to respect it. Right. So my husband was like, let's get them a 22. I was like, no, no, they're going to feel they gotta what kind of power comes out of that. Time. What's that? They got to cap their numbers one at a time. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, so they have always been exposed to them. And so they had their opportunity every time there was a new gun that came in the house. And we said, okay, you good? Do you have any more questions? Anything else? No, we're good. Okay. If you ever want to see it, you ever want to touch it, you ever want to shoot it, you talk to me. But if I find out that you have touched this without permission, heaven help you. And, and they know that's very, very serious. And with having the experience of shooting them, they know that it's very serious. And we've never, ever had a problem. Um, you know, I carry a gun every single day. My husband carries a gun every day. So they're out and about and they're around them all the time. And we've never had a problem. So it's definitely just a matter of culture. It's a matter of understanding. I mean, really, I think if you boil down the vast majority of issues we face, uh, firearms or not, it's a matter of ignorance. When someone is ignorant to something, they have more fear about it. And when you expose yourself to that thing and you learn about it, then the fear goes away. And I'm a big proponent of being fearless, right? Expose yourself to everything that makes you uncomfortable. And that doesn't mean you have to love it. That doesn't mean you have to carry a gun or you know whatever but you learn to respect it exactly yeah. i couldn't agree to figure out my fear of heights. <laughs> no that's that that's a whole other discussion point on that one so <laughs> uh, kind of to go back a little bit on your uh on like the fitness journey especially okay. as you do a lot is uh for companies in that way uh, what, what was it like to like first document it for yourself? And do you feel like a lot of people reach out to you for advice? Yeah, so I actually, so I've been training seriously for probably about three years now. I've always been active. I've always, you know, been into fitness. I got very focused on weightlifting. Like I said, um, strength training was a big goal. I also suffered since I was a teenager with a chronic disease called endometriosis. And after having my children, I developed adenomyosis and their reproductive diseases, they're extremely painful. Um, so I was experiencing chronic pain all the time. And as we know, uh, exercise can help alleviate pain. So that kind of coincided with like, okay, I'm gonna get really focused on exercise and fitness and see if this helps. And then when I was choosing what I wanted to do, I was like, I want to get stronger. So weightlifting. Um, and as I kind of grew into that and I, I'm not a trainer or anything like that, but I'm, I've educated myself about my body, what my body responds to, how to best train it. You know, all of the, like, I'm an expert on my own body and mm. people will ask me questions and I'm like, you know, I can give you what I know, but it might not be the best um, advice for yourself. So I do get a lot of people that reach out. And I recently um, collab or started working with a workout program called Rev Workouts. And this, I love this program. The owner of the company, I've actually known her since I was a teenager. We're very good friends. And she has an amazing story too. Like the way she, she has changed her life, she's a mindset and movement specialist. Like she's just an amazing person. Um, but she created this online platform. They have three, three different styles of working out. And because I fit in the strength and conditioning, she said, hey, I would love to work together on this. And 
So a lot of times now when people ask me for advice, like I'll give them to my understanding, but I'm like, look, I'm not a trainer and I can't necessarily tell you the best for yourself, but I have like a pocket full of experts over here and they're more than happy to help. So and this advice so was sponsored by. <laughs> yeah, this advice is sponsored by Go. Um, but I think it's really important to, I don't need to, to be like, oh, I'm an expert and I know everything. Some people have that, like fake it till you make it kind of thing. And I'm like, look, I don't I, like, you need to have the best advice possible because I think that's important for all of us. So if I can't give it to you, I can help you find it. Um, so for years I had people ask if I did a fitness blog or a fitness social media. And I was like, no, no, I just kind of do it for myself. And when I decided to make my profile public on Instagram, uh, I think before that I had been sharing stuff, but it was more just for myself because I had like 200 followers and it was just friends and family, you know, and they were just whatever, but it was more of like for myself, for my accountability, because I love to be able to go back and say this time last year, this is what I was lifting. And I was struggling with this part of this lift or I went through a phase where I had a really bad hip flexor problem. And so for me, that's why I started posting it because it's like a timeline, you know, that I can watch my own journey and so when I decided to go public, I was like, oh, I could share that with other people, right? And, and yeah, it's all just kind of developed, like no intentions of really being anything other than this is what I do. I've had a bunch of people ask if I do it and I guess I'll share it. And now it's just wild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So on a final question for this interview and something that I always like to ask all of my guests as well, What's the biggest change you want to see for yourself? For myself? Um, that is actually a question I've been asking myself is I didn't set out to build a platform, right? I didn't get on Instagram with this goal, but for whatever crazy reason, I have it. And so for me, I have been asking myself quite a bit lately, what do I want to do with this? Because we don't all have such a large voice. And I feel like I need to be very intentional with how I choose to use that. That's really important to me. Um, so I don't know that I have an answer for you yet. Um, obviously, I would love to continue building and growing with other companies. And of course, I mean, who wouldn't want to be able to monetize their social media. Um, I think that as far as being, you know, business owners or whatever, social media really is pivotal in monetizing. And so that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm in this weird place where I have a, a pretty large platform, but I also don't really think about it. Like in order for me to maintain being genuine and vulnerable, I can't think about who's seeing it. Like when I post things, I literally don't think about anyone that's going to see it. I post it for me the same way I always have. And I'm like, some people are going to hate it. Some people are going to love it. I don't care. Like, I don't care who sees it. I, I was scrolling through my stories the other night and I saw that one of the new kids on the block looked at my stories and I was like, oh my gosh. Oh, and, but I'm like, I can't pretty sick. All that stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it's so crazy to me to be in this realm, but like once in a while, I'll, I'll like look through that and just see like, it's interesting, right? Like the people you can connect with, but then by and large, I just don't pay attention to it. A lot of times my friends or my husband or whatever will be like, oh, you just hit 15,000. You just hit this many thousand. And I'm like, oh, did I, did I? Like, I try not to look at my own page. Well, that's a smart way to do it because the more you look at it, you're kind of like releasing your dopamine beforehand and you're not really staying focused on like things that can be good for your future because yeah. the more you just keep scrolling through, it's mm -hmm. going to distract you more in what you want to achieve in it. Yeah, absolutely. I spend like no time scrolling anymore. I go on, I try really hard. It's important to me to interact with my followers as much as I can. Um, I know that 
as a follower of other pages, I've always found it uh, a little disappointing if you try and interact with those pages and there's never any like feedback that you get from them. And so I, for me, I think it's important. I try really hard to interact with them. So I get on there and I try and reply to comments and messages and all of that stuff. Obviously there's some that I just delete and move on from, but um, that's what I do. Like I make my posts and I interact with my friends on there and I don't scroll, I don't compare it. Like, I know it sounds awful, but I don't see a lot of what other people are doing. I try my best to keep up with my feed of my friends and my uh, companies I work with and you know, that kind of stuff, people that I've connected on there. But as far as like exploring just randomly, I kind of keep my tunnel vision about what I'm doing and don't get all sucked into the rabbit hole. <laughs> well, I must say, as far as on this episode and the message that we have for the Change Within podcast, this has definitely been your world in our ears. And with that conclusion, that is our episode for 31 of the Change Within podcast. For those who haven't checked this out yet, but want to, please do so on Anchor, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Megan, thank you very much for joining me today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me. You as well. Absolutely. Bye-bye.